Showing on this episode of Law Weekly, we look at some of the lessons from the recent threats to America's democracy, the moves by the National Assembly to amend the Electoral Act, and again, the lack of financial independence of the judiciary. We chat with Senior Advocate of Nigeria and Queen's Counsel, Professor Fidelis Udita. Nasara and Lagos State get new judges. Plus our recap of some of the top stories from the courts. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shieli. During the week, President Donald Trump made history again, this time for being the first U.S. president to be impeached twice. On Wednesday, the 13th of January, members of the Democratic-controlled House made contributions for and against the vote of impeachment. And in the end, he was impeached by 232 to 197, with 10 Republicans siding with the Democrats. On this vote, the ayes are 232, the nays are 197. The res resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Trump is also facing trial, which will be held after he leaves office next Wednesday. If convicted, senators could vote to bar him from ever holding public office again. But what lessons can Nigeria learn from this? This was the starting point of my conversation with the Queen's Counsel, Professor Fidelis Odita, SAN. Um, I think the, the first and perhaps the most important thing is to understand that the president is subject to control. In Nigeria, there's a tendency to treat the president as if he were above the law. And we've heard in the past, for example, the Attorney General of the Federation saying that the president cannot attend, uh, cannot honor an invitation to come to the National Assembly. The president has authorized certain things in the national interest which are contrary to law and so on. You know, uh, those are officials who have placed the president above the law. But what we saw in the United States shows that indeed the president is subject to law and that law was exercised by um, the House of Representatives. But of course one has to bear in mind that much as what they did is laudable, nonetheless it was done largely by a democratic controlled House of Reps. There were only 10 members of the Republican Party that voted. But I heard the anchors on CNN uh, say that it was a non-partisan impeachment because um, 10 out of 207 Republicans voted to impeach. I mean, 10 is better than zero, mm -hmm. which they had last year. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that if, it was a, if, if the House was controlled by the Republicans, we may well not have seen the kind of outcome that we saw. I think in all likelihood, bearing in mind that only 10 Republicans voted in favor, and that even after the mob attack, several Republicans voted to uphold the objections, it must be doubtful whether a Republican-controlled House of Representatives would have impeached Trump the first time, or indeed the second time. Mm -hmm meaning that politics is largely the same everywhere. Absolutely. I think if it were here, there is very little chance that the APC, which is in the pocket of uh, Mr. Buhari, would vote to remove uh, Mr. Buhari from power. Quite apart from the frightening elevation of a president to almost a demigod status, politics would have played a large role. I suspect that in Nigeria, it might have been it might have degenerated into a fight of some sort because you know here we don't agree to follow processes someone must try to seize the mace or hijack or throw chairs mm -hmm. and therefore bring out the animal in them which is a disgrace in the aftermath of the declaration of the election results which you know was what led to all of this President Trump, his campaign, his Republican allies, they all filed cases in courts. I think I read of at least 42 legal challenges since the election day. They won zero. What do you think that our courts and our institutions can also learn from that? Yes, I think that that's an important question because our courts have played a um, very controversial role in elections. For example, we can look at the election into the governorship of Imo State, 
We can look at the election into the governorship of Oshun State amongst many. The courts have replaced the people as the electoral body, which is frankly unconstitutional and it is wrong. There must be some limit to the rule of interpretation. And so what we saw with the American courts is a true reflection of the role the court should play. Election of candidates is for the electorate, it is not for the court. When the uh, elections have been held and the electorate have chosen someone, the court must uphold that election. And we saw that, notwithstanding that a number of the judges were appointed by Mr. Trump, mm -hmm. nonetheless they voted to reject um, his challenge. And I think um, there were up to 70 challenges. 70? Yes. And he lost every single one of them. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Nigeria, what you might have found is some judge in Port Harcourt granted an injunction against someone in Sokoto, you know, so the judges... Yeah, you have and, conflicting You have orders. conflicting orders. So the judges do not respect themselves. And when they want people to call them my lord or my lady, you have to dignify yourself first and to place yourself where you have been placed. But if you place yourself like a tout, you don't expect people to respect you. And frankly, many, or perhaps not many, some of the orders which have emanated from the courts are, to say the least, very unbecoming of judicial officers. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that when we criticize our colleagues who sit on the bench, often they feel that we don't appreciate the dynamics of litigation or the choices that they have got to make. But I know that everyone has to make choices and we just saw the American judges make those choices and we're saying our own judges should try as much as possible to make similar choices. Um, so in saying that the American courts upheld, we also have to bear in mind that Nigerian elections are not often like the American presidential election. And it's possible that if our elections were as transparent and credible as the American um, presidential elections, or indeed other elections which the courts have upheld, that our courts will similarly uphold them. We hope so. And we all look forward to the day that the elections will be transparent and credible, and the judges will do their best or perform their role to uphold the outcome of those elections. Mm. You've touched on a very critical point of the transparency of the election process and now our National Assembly is in the process yet again of amending the Constitution and the Electoral Act. I heard, I've read of some, um, some of the recommendations they've made, local government uh, tenures in the FCT to be reviewed to four years instead of three years and some other uh, recommendations like that. But what do you think that they should be focusing on? as they embark on this process of, of uh, reform? I have always thought that we over-legislate. And you can see that in several areas. It's not just the electoral laws, every law. We've had a constitution for, what, about 20, 21 years? And we've had several amendments, and we're in the process of amending it. And then some countries, like the United Kingdom, have operated without a written constitution. And the United States has had very few amendments, maybe. I'm not sure uh, the precise number now, but um, their constitution has existed for almost 200 years with, at best, double-digit amendments. We've had ours for just a few years, and every day we're busy amending. Well, our problem is not necessarily the inadequacy of the legal framework. It's the unwillingness to apply and comply with the rules. And also... And that's something you can't legislate. And that's something you can't legislate. So they keep making new laws, but they don't obey the existing ones. Why would they obey these new ones? And they have to ask themselves, why is it that Nigerians have refused to obey simple laws? And you see that everywhere, even when you get to a traffic light, you see a traffic light is red, four or five cars are there, and some idiot will drive past that red light, putting everyone else's life in danger. And then you ask yourself, why on earth does that person think that these four or five or six people who are waiting have nowhere they want to hurry to? And it's just a problem. I see many of the people 
in Nigeria who refuse to obey even the simplest things, traffic laws. They obey every single law when they go abroad. Mm -hmm. And the reason they do that is because if they don't, there will be... Consequences. There will be, there will be immediate and effective consequence. But here, there is no consequence, so you can act with impunity. So I'm afraid I'm not at all enthused by the existence of legislative processes to amend the Electoral Act or to amend any other legislation, because our problem is not necessarily the inadequacy of the existing legal framework. It's the inability or unwillingness to enforce the existing framework. I know that you must have seen the case with the magistrates in Cross River State. It brings to the fore the issue of the, the underfunding of the judiciary, the financial independence of the judiciary, which the judiciary has been complaining about for a long time. We've talked about uh, the courts in America and what they will do. And some people will say, well, our courts in Nigeria, our judges are not well paid. You can't expect them to be independent when an act, you know, to secure the nation, when an act in national interest, when they don't determine the post, they don't control the post. So issues of underfunding in, in, in the judiciary, financial independence, how do you think that it can best be tackled? Um, I'd like to touch very briefly on that Cross River State, because it's not clear what's happening in Cross River State. I noticed that there were about 30 magistrates protesting uh, over non-payment of salaries for 24, 24 months. I don't know whether it's just those 30 who are affected or whether there are more of them. I because think those 30 who were just recently appointed yes. about that. Uh, and I cannot imagine that there are just 30 magistrates in, in, the, whole in the whole of Cross River State. So there must be issues which affect those 30. Um, I see that there are allegations that they were irregularly recruited or there are irregularities affecting their recruitment and therefore until those irregularities are sorted out, why should state funds be applied in paying them? Um, so they need to, I think, on both sides, so the side of the magistrates and the side of the state government, they need to take urgent steps to resolve whatever irregularities there are. And that's the same thing that I talked about earlier. I don't understand how you can have irregularities which have not been exposed or resolved for 24 months, for goodness sake. It must be more expeditious ways of doing that. But having said that, um, it is a fact that the judiciary is underfunded. And that's in part because um, they are not responsible for appropriation. But it's also in part because the judiciary have refused to exercise their powers. You can assert your power. I can give a power to you. I can give you the same power and I give someone else. That person can assert their authority, exercise that power properly. And then, by virtue of the way you exercise that power, you attract more things. But if you weaken yourself and every day you go cap in hand begging a governor sitting outside the governor's office for two or three hours waiting for your turn and you're supposed to be a judge why would anyone respect you so the first thing is that the judges must respect their position that's number one two there have been attempts to make their pay independent and we see for example uh, section 81 3 of the constitution which says any amount meant for them should be disbursed by the National Judicial Council directly to the heads of a state or federal court involved. And there are equivalent provisions, I think, for the states. It's probably section 121, subsection 3, which says the, the, the amount due to the judiciary from the state consolidated revenue fund should be sent to the head of a court in the states. But of course, we know that in practice, the governors don't do that. And there is, the question is, why not? And what is the sanction for not doing so? Why what can't? Is the sanction? Yeah. Well, there are sanctions. If um, uh, <coughs> the judges, for example, the judges can refuse to do state's business, for example. Um, the, the chief judge on behalf of the yeah. um, judges can write to the governor and say, we won't allow this, and tell them that we must get the money. But you must assert your authority. You can't just be beggarly and expect that. You must assert your authority. And I don't see very many um, chief judges asserting their authority. Those that I have discussed with will tell you that if you take an aggressive position, they won't give you um, fringe benefits like cards and so on. But that's not my experience. I find in practice that actually people who assert their authority tend to get 
uh, more respected and they tend to get what they, they deserve. A third aspect is that on the whole, I don't know who divides the judge's salary. At the state level, for example, the basic salary and even the allowances of a judge who has been serving for 20 years are exactly the same with a rookie judge who has just been appointed today. I don't know who could have designed. It does just make sense. Don't the judges have an input into things like that? They must do. I don't know who does that, but I know as a fact that the basic salary of a judge who has been serving for 20, 30 years is exactly the same salary of a judge who was appointed today, and it just doesn't make sense. You have to have a way of paying judges according to their experience. Welcome back. Nasarawa State in the North Central Zone has appointed six new judicial officers to improve the administration of justice. Five of the new judges were appointed as High Court judges, while one was appointed the acting president of the Customary Court of Appeal. The six were sworn in on Monday the 11th of January by Governor Abdullahi Sule, who restated his administration's willingness to upscale the capacity of judicial officers in the state to meet global standards. And so that's a confirmation of that. Government has ensured the appointment of the right caliber of people as judges and provided essential working tools for the institution in addition to sundry welfare packages. Let me restate that. No matter how much investment government makes, structures, equipment, and other incentives on their own do not translate to excellence in service delivery. What is imperative is that the personnel in discharge must own hold the values and ethics of their respective offices and prestige of their calling. On this premise, therefore, government will continue to ensure capacity development of the judicial personnel through periodic training. This development is coming a few weeks after the state got its first female chief judge, Justice Aisha Aliyu, who was also sworn in by the governor to serve the state in an acting capacity pending approval from the National Judicial Council. Hi. Hi. In the southwest, the Lagos State Governor Babajide Sonwulu on Wednesday the 13th of January swore in two new High Court judges, charging them to discharge their duties diligently to the people in the state. They are Justice Olubukala Aigbukabo, who until our appointment was the Deputy Chief Registrar Special Duties Lagos Division, and Justice Raman Oshodi, who once acted as Secretary to the Arbitration and Alternative Dispute Resolution Committee of the Section on Business Law. At the swearing-in ceremony, Governor Sonwolu also asked the new judges to leverage on their performance to take the state judiciary to greater heights. You have done very well. That's where you are here today. I've never met any of you before, like the CJ said, and it is your work that has reflected here today. And I want to say that that which you've done thus far, um, you certainly need to also do a lot more because not only will the eyes be on you now, people will be expected a whole lot more from you. And I can tell you that you will succeed. I can see the vibrancy, you know, in the two of you. It's a blend of the young and the not so young. And it goes to reflect how vibrant our judicial is. But more importantly, is to reassure the judiciary that um, all of the events and all of the promises we gave you last year we're fully aware of it and will not shy away from those responsibility. We will, by the grace of Almighty God, build for you bigger, nicer, more beautiful chambers that will speak to the quality of service we render to our citizens. The Chief Judge of Lagos, Justice Kazim Alogba, said the occasion was another testimony of the Governor's commitment to the judiciary and the administration of justice in the state. And on the home stretch, we bring you a recap of some of the activities from the courtrooms across the country. We begin with the report that the Court of Appeal sitting in Abuja has dismissed the appeal filed by three persons 
challenging the emergence of Mr. Yahaya Bello as the governorship candidate of the All Progressives Congress in the 2015 governorship election held in the state. The appellants had asked the Federal High Court to declare that Governor Bello was not a qualified candidate, having not been a registered voter in Kogi State. In a unanimous judgment delivered by Justice Stephen Adda, the court held the nomination of candidates is the duty of political parties and not that of members of any constituency. The three-man panel of the court for the held that the appellants never contested the governorship primaries and therefore lacked the locus to challenge the nomination of Mr. Yahaya Bello as a candidate of the APC. Justice Ada, while affirming the judgment of the Federal High Court, delivered on the 20th of March 2018, said the appeal had become an academic exercise. In a quiet bomb state, the High Court sitting in Uyo has adjourned to April 1st the case brought by the Independent National Electoral Commission against Professor Ignatius Uduk of the University of Uyo. He was arraigned before the court, presided over by Justice Achibong Achibong on a three count charge of abandoning his assigned duties as a collation and returning officer of a State House of Assembly election and unlawfully generating scores and entering same in Form EC8E thereby committing an offence punishable under Section 122, Subsection 1 of the Electoral Act of 2010 as amended. Professor Uduk was also charged for announcing and circulating false and fake election results contrary to and punishable under Section 123, Subsection 4 of the Electoral Act of 2010 as amended. He was also charged for perjury, lying on oath, contrary to Section 119, Subsection 1 of the Criminal Code Law, Laws of Aquibum State 2000. At the last sitting of the court, the professor's counsel raised objections to the appearance of a new prosecuting counsel for INEC, but the new counsel cited several portions of the law to justify his appearance. The defense counsel subsequently applied for an adjournment to enable him present his argument to support his rejection of the new prosecution counsel. The court has adjourned the case to April 1st. In Abuja, the money laundering trial of a former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation, Mohamed Bello Adoke, could not go on owing to his absence in court. His counsel, Kanu Agabi, informed Justice Iangekwo of the Federal High Court of Abuja that his client could not make it to court as he was held back in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, after testing positive to COVID-19. He pleaded with the court for an extension of the time given to the defendant to take care of himself and be fit for trial. At the last adjourned date, December 15, 2020, the court had granted Adoke permission to travel to Dubai on health grounds but was expected to return before the hearing. Still in Abuja, a chief magistrate court has granted bail to the convener of Revolution Now, Mr. Omoyele Shuware, and four others standing trial for alleged unlawful assembly, criminal conspiracy and inciting public disturbance. Ruling on the bail application filed on behalf of the defendants, Chief Magistrate Mabel Shegun Bello admitted Mr. Shore to bail in the sum of 20 million naira and two shorties in like sum. The court also ordered Shore to remain in Abuja and must physically report to the court registrar every Monday and Friday pending the hearing and determination of the case against him. The court further ordered that one of his shorties must be a civil servant, not below grade level 12. The trial was then adjourned to February the 5th. Round off with the report that the 7th Division General Court Martial, Operation Lafia Dole, has sentenced a soldier arraigned for murder to death by hanging. The court tried the erring soldier, Trooper Azuna Madwabuchi, and established that in July 2020, he opened fire at close range, emptying nine rounds of his magazine on Lieutenant Babakaka Ungogi and killing him instantly. Madwabuchi was serving at the 212 Battalion Bama when he committed the offense. He was angry that his application for a travel leave to enable him rectify some problems with his bank was turned down by the adjutant who he shot. The president of the court martial, Brigadier General Arikpo Aikubi, in his ruling said the trooper betrayed the trust bestowed on him by the Nigerian army. The offense, according to Aikubi, has a mandatory sentence for the murderer who is to suffer death by firing squad in accordance with the Section 106 of the Armed Forces Act. Six other soldiers were also arraigned for assault, manslaughter and unprofessional conduct and reckless handling of arms, causing bodily harm to civilians and death. 
And that's our program this week. Don't forget that you can find these and past episodes of the program on our YouTube page. I'm Shola Shieli. Thank you for watching and see you next week.